today more or less as an illustration of um, how you can use uh, uh, this image decode, so RAM test in particular, uh, to investigate an astrophysical problem. So I will um, speak about the collapse of a dense core um, and try to emphasize the role of the magnetic field uh, in this process. Let me just uh, try to give you some context um, that you, I think it's important to have in mind when uh, doing star formation studies. Uh, first of all, I would like to emphasize the fact that uh, the interstellar cycle is really sitting in the middle um, of the, um, the universe, in a sense, because it makes the connection between the large scale structures to the planets. And so uh, to understand the planets, you really need to understand this uh, series of processes. Um, so uh, today, I'm going to more uh, specifically address the question on how do you go from the dense cores located in molecular clouds to the stars. And uh, meanwhile, of course, by the virtue of the angular momentum conservation, or maybe I should say sufficient angular momentum conservation, um, you uh, would like to form a disk in which uh, planets will form. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to try to cover that specifically. Okay. Um, maybe for those of you which are not doing collapse calculation uh, every day, I thought it would be good to uh, put a little bit of, of context. Um, so the sort of first calculation uh, has been done by Laxon in '69. Okay. Can you? Can you? Uh, and, and, and what is nice, what is in fantastic is that this calculation is still valid today. Okay, so if you manage to do a calculation which survived for more than 40 years now, I guess you will be extremely successful. So, um, you, so, um, the, so the, the sort of picture is that you, you have a first phase where the gas is more or less isothermal and where you develop an R-2 um, kind of power laws, um, it's near free fall collapse, okay? Uh, and then, so the velocity is increasing. Um, at some stage when the uh, gas or the dust uh, become opaque to its own radiation, you switch from an isothermal equation of state to essentially an adiabatic equation of state. So uh, thermal pressure is able to halt the collapse, and then you have an accretion shock. <coughs> it's called the first Larsen core. And then uh, matter spikes up. So the temperature, and the, because the pressure increased, temperature increase, and as you reach a density, sorry, a temperature of about 2000 K, H2 uh, start dissociating. To do that, you need 4.4 electron volt, which in terms of temperature is high, I mean higher than the temperature uh, of your of your core, which means that you have a very efficient cooling process, a very efficient sink of energy. Therefore, you s start subtracting thermal energy cooling, and you, uh, for that reason, the collapse will restart. Uh, so you have the so-called second collapse phase, um, which will brings you uh, up to densities, to stellar densities, and to the formation of the protostar itself. Okay. So having uh, this whole sequence is extremely difficult because the, the, the contrast of, of scale and density is just enormous, stellar densities uh, and uh, when the ratio between the initial densities and stellar densities is like 15 order of the magnitude or something like that. So it's just too large to be attacked. Uh, well, you can do the second collapse, but then you do only that, and and uh, and you, you press, your protostellar your protostar will be extremely tiny in terms of mass. We we cannot uh, now, unfortunately, follow the protostar uh, up to very very high mass. So we have to stop somewhere uh, the calculation. And so typically, uh, what is done in uh, in most of the calculation is to stop uh, in terms of resolution. The, the calculation at this stage where uh, you form the 
the first Larsen core sometimes slightly before that. Okay, so that's what I'm going today to do tomorrow, uh, to the, today and just now, um, to tr try to address uh, the, this phase here, and all the game is what, which is not in included in this calculation, um, essentially to deal with this, this collapse when you have rotation and then when you have on top of that magnetic field. So <coughs> the plan of, uh, of the, the talk is uh, as follows. Uh, first I'm going to describe a little bit uh, the issue of what magnetic field does to, uh, to the collapse, in particular to the, the rotation, uh, the so-called catastrophe, so I think it's a very bad way uh, to think to that problem. Um, then people have been trying to alleviate the catastrophe, so that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, but then at the, at the end I will ask that actually I think there was a catastrophe that we were not aware of. And that uh, likely enough the magnetic fields uh, lead us to a picture which is much more compatible with the observation. Okay. Um, and second, I will um, address this, the issue of the fragmentation um, and this so-called uh, maybe crisis for low mass cores at least uh, that magnetic field seems to be extremely efficient to actually quench the fragmentation at least at the early stage. Um, I will propose uh, various ways uh, to solve it. I think the issue is unsettled at the moment. Um, and then I will address the question of what does it, in the context of more high mass cores or say cluster types of calculation? Um, and then, uh, so first considering only the magnetic field, and then considering uh, the more complete uh, physical processes when um, relative feedback is also included. And then uh, I again address a few observations. Okay. Uh, let me first remind you that so the magnetic field is uh, observed, um, is measured, also there is a big spread uh, in, the in the measure, but also probably uh, large uncertainty is due to the technique, so I don't think we understand extremely well the initial conditions for cores yet. That's true for the magnetic intensity, but that's also true for the rotation and also true for the velocity field in general. So that's, I think it's why having an uh, extremely strong conclusion it's a very dangerous game at the moment. I think these things are sort of known to some extent but we, we don't know the distribution of the initial conditions. I mean that, sh that should be clear and that's why uh, we must I don't think we, we, we should not be too affirmative in my opinion on the conclusions we get. Um, so anyway uh, we, it seems that um, the magnetic field we are observing are close to be sort of critical and I should have uh, defined some way of these parameters so I apologize for forgetting to, to do that. So essentially um, you can uh, define the mass, the so-called mass to flux over critical mass to flux ratio and here the important um, I guess uh, idea is that uh, if the magnetic field is strong enough at some point it will be uh, sufficient to compensate for uh, gravity and it, it can essentially stop the collapse. So this is this idea which was behind uh, the magnetically regulated star formation um, and that would correspond to this line here. Okay? Uh, so those cores could be possibly supported by the magnetic field and those, and those cores are not. Okay? The magnetic field is too weak to stabilize the cores against the magnetic field which by no means means that the magnetic field is doing nothing and that you can not uh, and that you can ignore it. Actually all the rest of the talk will be addressing this regime here. Okay. Um, and just to try to convince you I will uh, show you again uh, well not exactly the same but similar set of simulation I was showing you uh, during the first uh, lecture. So this is uh, uh, the inner part of the fermenting core. So this kind of calculation have been done by many many teams around the world uh, so you essentially uh, see the consequence of conserving angular momentum so you form 
a massive disk, uh, more massive than the disk that was have been described previously uh, by Tom. So those disks have a very large, a very low uh, tumor parameters. They quickly fragment, and uh, so you form uh, therefore multiple uh, systems, maybe three, five uh, objects here, and you see all the dynamics uh, is largely happening in the equatorial plan. If you have a magnetic field, and here the, this mass to flux ratio is 2, which means that the magnetic field is two times weaker than gravity. So if you were increasing the strength of the field by a factor 2, the magnetic field would be able to compensate for gravity and you would have no collapse. So the, here in this simulation, it's two times weaker, which is the typical numbers uh, uh, which is inferred from observations, okay? I'm not arguing again about a factor of a few. I don't think we know the thing sufficiently accurately anyway. So I would say typically compatible with the uh, uh, in values inferred from the current observations. So you see here uh, you have a drastic change of paradigm. Uh, instead of having one big D's that fragment, you have nothing, okay? You have just one single core. It's extremely boring. It falls directly in the center. This one is much more fun, uh, but that's it. So uh, as a compensation, we get more funny things happening uh, along the other directions, where you see this time something funny happening. Uh, so you have this outflow being spontaneously launched, and that's because uh, the field lines are heavily twisted. Okay, the, the fact that you have uh, the rotation and the, uh, the magnetic field lines, which as I mentioned during the lectures, uh, uh, sort of maintain the memory to the flow. Okay, if you do that in the hydro, that's it. I mean, it's like if you have been doing nothing. It's not the case if you are a magnetic field. It keeps memory of what you have been doing, and then you twist the field lines more and more and more and more. And at the end, uh, you have so much uh, energy, magnetic energy which had been stored, that, that's it, you start expanding, okay? And you launch these outflows which uh, carries, uh, car carry angular momentum with them. Yeah? Where, where, where does it come from? Yeah. Um, it's probably, I mean, it's, it's, what, it's observed in the ISM. Uh, in the old galaxy, we know that there is a magnetic field present. Okay, so the origin of the magnetic field uh, has been debated uh, during the, say, the last decades or so. Nowadays, I think it's almost a consensus that there is galactic dynamo. So the, okay, the detail of the dynamo may are still a bit controversial as usual, uh, but yeah, likely that's what happened. And it's probably a multi-scale field. Okay, uh, when you do a turbulent. Uh, calculation or MHD calculations, you find that the magnetic field is having a power laws, which is not too different from the Kolmogorov type exponent, meaning that most of the energy is on the large shells. Uh, so essentially, when you pick up, you see a piece of ISM, at the scale you are investigating it, you can, to the first order, treat it as a mean flux, as a mean field. Of course. There are always fluctuation, everything, okay? And the, the good way to deal with this is probably to take, to, to do zoom simulation and so on, okay? Yeah? Do you see convergence between increasing this parameter here to uh, MHC to lighter? Do you just get I, I will address that question later. Okay. Yes, but uh, you have to go to very, very low mu to get uh, the hydro ish uh, behavior. At magnetic field, even low field, are quickly amplified. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is that as long as you have differential motions, even a seed field is quickly amplified. Okay? If you have a dynamo, it's an exponential growth. If it's not a dynamo, it's a linear growth. So if you, if you have time enough, okay, if you have enough time, no matter how, how, how weak is your field, it will get amplified. So it's a question of, uh, different time scale in your flow. Okay, that you have to compare. Yeah. In the previous uh, simulation uh, with the magnetic field, how is how, how, how is the uh, magnetic field amplitude? How is uh, how is the magnetic field? The amplitude? Amplitude. 
it's mu equal to, which means that the magnetic field is two times weaker than gravity. So it's uh, depending on your school of circuit, it's either a weak or a strong field. If you come from hydro, it's a very strong field. If you, if you come from a magnetically regulated star formation, it's a very weak field. So I let you decide. But <laughs> mu equal to, then you decide. So, uh, yeah, as I said, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's typically not far from what is observed so in the ISM. Uh, Yes, that I'm going to address that in the second part of the talk if I can reach it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, right. So, just to be slightly more uh, accurate, uh, those are the uh, the profile uh, through the coals in a precisely in a very weak magnetic field case, and in the so mu equal to case, I call it strong field. And you see, uh, so the profile uh, we could guess from the simulation are very different. Um, so this is your uh, radial velocity, and that's the rotation velocity. You see here uh, the presence of a centrifugally supported disk, and here the presence of a semi supported core, um, and that's the rotation curves. And you see in this case, you, you, have, you do not have two shocks, you have a single shock. So you directly shock onto the uh, thermally supported core, and uh, there is not enough rotation. There is still rotation left, okay, but it's not sufficiently strong to uh, to uh, leads to the formation of a centrifugally supported disk. And here, I just uh, I'm going to try to make this clearer later, but I think it's important to do it, try to do it clear immediately uh, when we say disk. Okay, this can mean many, 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 many things. Okay, and what people uh, usually tends to hear when you say disk, they tend to have in mind the tethery disk, which have been extensively uh, studied, both observationally, theoretically, everything, and which are there. And we are not addressing that here because, as I said, uh, those those phases are extremely um, early phase. So those. If anything, those would be class zero disk. Okay, and nowadays it's extremely difficult to get to the very very late phase. Some people have been doing it. Whether I believe it or not, this result I don't know. Uh, there are many many issues with the numerics, but also the physics. Um, so here I'm, I'm really discussing very early disk. So that the, this slide should be no early class zero disk. Really. Okay, um, and as uh, you see, I think the issue as to whether this guy exists, uh, or more accurately, I'm sure they exist, but what's the physical characteristics of those guys is, I think, not even less well known than the other disk. Let's phrase it this way. Okay, so um, what may be happening here, uh, I think it's always important when you do some numerical works to do in parallel analytical work and try to do your best to see whether you can get some agreement. Um, so here the idea is to just have simple orders of magnitudes. I will try to be slightly more accurate later, but the problem is hopefully nonlinear and the geometry are just so full, so it's very difficult to carry out uh, accurate modeling. So here uh, I'm just essentially trying to estimate a time. So if you combine these two equations, you get a sort of Alphen-like time. So you have the, uh, well, the typical Alphen waves, uh, or the so Alphen speed, and you, the typical uh, size you may want to consider is the thickness of, of the layer, uh, which well, could be, uh, say, the, the, the disk you are trying to form, say, this way. So you are comparing uh, the rotation time with uh, this sort of breaking time, or the transport uh, of the angular momentum through the alpha waves. Um, and so if you compare these two time, and if you just uh, use reasonable estimate for, for example, the rotation, take the, the Kleperian one, uh, you take uh, the mass, and then you plug everything into, into this, this ratio, and then so you obtain that, that, that value here that you can express as a function of this, um, of the, of this mu parameter, which describes the strengths of the uh, magnetic field and gravity. Uh, then you see that 
it's not that surprising to see that even for relatively low value of the magnetization, if you trust the simple estimates, uh, it's difficult to form disk, just because the uh, the um, braking time turns out to be typically smaller than the rotation time, even for quite modest value of the magnetic field. Okay, so that seems to be the reason uh, of why a couple of steam have been found that uh, it's difficult to form disk when you have a uh, magnetized collapse. And I should stress immediately that uh, when you have magnetic collapse where the magnetic field and the rotation axis are, are aligned. Okay? So it, it has been seen as, as a problem. As I said, I'm not entirely convinced it's a problem. But OK, let's, let's try to, um, to, to see, say, how robust is this result. And what, what's happened if you shake things a bit? So like, let's try to, to vary the parameters. So the first things you may, I mean, the, the question you may obviously ask is, OK, I've been considering a uh, magnetic field and rotation axis um, initially align. Uh, what's happen if I, if I tilt uh, the magnetic field? I mean, we know that there is much, um, there, there's a lot of turbulence in the ISM. Um, likely enough, there is no reason why the magnetic field and the uh, rotation axis should be aligned initially. And uh, actually, uh, we find out that for intermediate uh, field strengths, um, which means typically mass to flux ratio of the order of 5, 4. I mean, uh, can we can argue, uh, I'm not going to argue the, the exact value of this parameter. So for, say, typically intermediate magnetization, uh, the angle here matters a lot. Um, as you see, if you increase this angle, so 0, essentially, you have no disk. I will come back later to the detail of these things here. Um, as, as long as uh, you, you get a small angle like 20 degrees, you start something appearing here. It's an engine disk in that case. And if you uh, have a 90 degree tilt, then you definitely see something which uh, look like a rotating disk. So uh, this picture has been uh, addressed in few papers and confirmed by a different team recently who essentially uh, find very, very similar results. So more quantitatively, um, this is the sort of the mass of the disk for various angle as a function of time and for this magnetization. So you see when the disk is uh, aligned, uh, or so even the magnetic field is aligned, you find a very, very small disk. It's at, at some point, well, you must realize that it's even complicated to define the disk. It's not, again, like uh, in the late phase where you have a well-defined object. Those are messy, accreting, rotating structure. And when there's turbulence, it's even worse. So to some extent, it almost depends on your definition. And there should be, and I think it will come soon, and it may to some extent have already started, uh, be a phase where the disk should be defined like observer defined them. Okay? Because when you get to some complicated structure which is strongly accreting, uh, you can set up parameters, yes, but what they exactly mean, it's unclear. So I guess what we want at the end of the day is to confront directly the observation with the simulation. So that this works, I think, uh, is starting. And it will, I'm sure, continue during the, the coming year. So for now, we define this uh, in a reasonable ways uh, using threshold for the ratio of the uh, uh, azimutal over radial velocity, these things. Okay, so these are reasonable, but we figure out that at some stage it's the definition dependent. Huh? So, um, so, but in any case, you see a strong difference here. Uh, for mu equal to, uh, you see no, well, almost no difference. Well, you see, a, you do see a difference, uh, but it, it's not, it's not huge. And what is important is that the magnetic field, the disk, if there is a disk, because as like I said, it's really definition dependent at this stage. Those are very, very small guys, much smaller than what you have uh, in, in the non-aligned uh, intermediate magnetic field case. So of course, you expect the angular momentum to be uh, 
to be smaller, and that's what we did. So we measure uh, the angular momentum for various configurations. So those are various angle and various magnetization and various density threshold. So you actually do find that it is lower when uh, the magnetic field is uh, inclined and when it's, than when it's aligned. Uh, we have also been measuring the flux directly, so the magnetic torque, if you want, and uh, to, to see whether it was really the magnetic torque that was stronger. And yeah, typically we confirm it is the case. OK. So uh, it would be nice to have at least uh, a small idea uh, of why the magnetic field um, or the braking is more efficient in the aligned case than in the perpendicular case. Again, it's difficult because the, the problem is very nonlinear. And what was a bit uh, counterintuitive is that uh, the typical picture that was around um, was that the magnetic braking was actually more efficient when the field was perpendicular uh, to the rotation axis than when it was aligned. And then you do the simulation and oh, you find the contrary. So <coughs> twist your mind. What? Check everything, different configuration, robust. Oh, what should I do? Well, then you come back to the equation and you start to understand what's going on. Um, so the classical analysis, which uh, have been done by essentially Markus Muscovias and others, is to simply estimate um, the, the ratio of the bracking by saying that when you have a rotating course here, uh, the, it, it's launching alpha waves, OK? And uh, the, the core is going to, to be significantly brack when your alpha waves uh, will have swept uh, a current density uh, which is comparable to the current density of the core. Okay? Uh, because this means in that case that you have, given, you have been given an amount of angular momentum to the surrounding medium which is comparable to the uh, angular momentum that was present initially. So that gives you uh, time scales which uh, uh, is, is written here, okay, and then um, then it turns out that the field geometry matters a lot. So um, the reason is if your field lines are actually uh, 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 are open, okay, if they are strongly fanning out your structure <coughs> like this, okay, they are not straight. Well, then you see there is this so-called, uh, well, you can almost call it a lever arm at this stage. Um, if, you f if you track your piece of fluids, which will move along these field lines, okay, you will see that first um, the inertia momentum is going to increase okay, because it's getting away from the rotation axis. And that gives you an L to the 2 uh, here. But then, if you assume co-rotation uh, uh, for, for the magnetic field line, it means that uh, the angular momentum of your fluid particle is actually not conserved. It is getting accelerated by the magnetic tension. So it is getting extra angular momentum um, from, the, from the magnetic tension. And that's, if you assume co-rotation, that gives you another uh, air to the two. So at the end of the day, you get an air to the four here. So you see, uh, uh, now you have modified the previous picture by the, this air to the four, which is a big, can be a big number. And if you express everything as before in terms of mass, then you get that the, uh, the uh, braking time is shorter with respect to the align configuration by a ratio uh, of L to the core divided by uh, the final radius to the 2. Okay? Um, so if this uh, ratio is high, and uh, it's typically high because during the collapse of a core, the field lines are strongly uh, dragged in. Okay? So typically by the side of the core itself, maybe up to the size of the disk, more or less, or even the first Larsen core itself. So it's a very large factor. So this means that this ratio here is very high, and it's to the 2. Uh, and then if you compare um, what you would expect from the other configuration, so the perpendicular case, which I guess is a mess, as you can see from the sort of sketch here, um, 
you find that in, in this case you expect a slightly different um, typical time because now you have a cylinder so the uh, half and wave sort of propagates uh, in, in sort of a 2D cylinder okay so you have a geometry uh, geometric uh, call effect uh, so you have to well it's not difficult but you just have to repeat the, the, the calculations here um, and so the the, uh, the final result of this calculation is this mass to flux ratio divided this time by the the ratio, uh, I mean the density of the core to the minus one half, while previously we had the density of the envelope to the minus one half. So that's what led, uh, I guess, Muscovias and co-workers to conclude that the magnetic bracking was more efficient if you were aligned than if you were perpendicular. Sorry, the contrary. If you were perpendicular, that if you were aligned, that was this density ratio, which comes from pure geometric configuration. So this calculation is right, but uh, when they compare the time scale, they did not take into account this finding out of the field lines, which I think is the one that should be applied in the, in the context of strongly collapsing dense cores, because the field line has, has been quizzed. Okay, and as we saw. Uh, when you, there is a strong fanning out of the field line, the magnetic bracking is significantly shorter because of, of, this, of this effect. Okay? So when, if now you compare the uh, bracking time in the align configuration taking into account this effect and the bracking time in the perpendicular configuration, then you find, okay, because of this, uh, of this, this correction here, that typically, okay, if you assume then uh, some uh, density dependence like R minus two, then you find exactly the reverse than what uh, Muscovy has concluded, which I repeat is entirely correct for uh, a core in which the field lines are not are not st uh, finding out. Okay, so maybe for the initial phase of the core this is fine, but for later phase I think it's not because of this effect. Okay, right. So. Uh, it's uh, difficult, unfortunately, to go beyond that sort of conclusion and to be more quantitative because the geometry is, is very, very difficult. Yes? Uh, I think it's sort of reasonable that we are never far from that. That's what we, we should observe. I mean, there is certainly a phase during which it's not the case, but quickly enough because the alpha speed is, is sort of decreasing, is, is increasing uh, as you propagate outwards, it's typically what's happened. Okay. I mean, I, I agree that all these effects could be important at some stage. Uh, as you see, it's uh, not an easy problem to track analytically. Okay, um, so another um, effect which is probably not um, totally distinguishable from this one is uh, the role of, of turbulence um, and <coughs> it has been first pointed out by uh, Santos de Lima et al, so Vitalik Lazarian, so they run a series of simulation uh, so this is hydro, this is pure ideal MHD uh, this is resistive MHD but with a very very uh, high uh, omit dissipation, I mean something like 100 times the value that is relevant for the ISM and this is ideal MHD with turbulence Okay, so what they found is that uh, when turbulence is included, uh, you form a small disk, uh, which is much smaller than, than the hydro disk, okay, but which is much bigger than the uh, purely uh, uh, ideal MHD without turbulence. And this has been uh, this calculation has been uh, performed by other groups, uh, including us. So, in for example, here we have been measuring the magnetic, uh, so the critical mass of X ratio as a function uh, of time and for different uh, radius and <coughs> so what we found is that the uh, turbulence actually transport outwards the magnetic flux therefore it reduces the magnetic flux that you have in the inner part of your core and for that reason it helps to reduce the amount of magnetic bracking which is available that's one effect the other effect is that you also have uh, uh, an angle uh, between the field and the rotation axis uh, so it becomes hard to disentangle everything um, it has also been hard by Seyfried et al at the configuration um, of the 
uh, of the magnetic field being messy could also reduce the flux. So it's difficult to find exactly, well, uh, well this is this effect which is going on. There is a trend which, seems, which is confirmed by various groups and we have good reason to think that things should go in that direction. Again, it's difficult to do quantitative estimate. Yeah. Do you buy that? Or? And claimed that that's not what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Well, in the first paper, but in the last one, uh, it, they are less informative. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's not easy. I mean, reconnection is, is probably uh, playing a role here. Uh, we, we try to quantify the things a bit. It, it's not extremely easy, I should say. Um, so yeah, essentially, I think you are moving your field line around more or less in a systematic direction. Why, how to quantify that exactly, uh, I confess, I, I don't know. I mean, we could rely loosely on this uh, turbulent uh, diffusivity. It's difficult to do much than that at this stage, I would say. Can you also, on, on that plot, when, when, sorry, the, the, just can you explain the, the titles 20% of turbulence or 5%? The oh, wait, you're sorry, that's the initial uh, turbulent energy uh, versus uh, gravitational energy. Oh, so actually you could, I think, probably justify it when you go up to... Sorry? Oh, we could, could go up, you mean? Yeah, I mean, that was the parameter studies, and we also, uh, I mean, the sad, oh, I don't know whether it's sad or not, but it turns out that if you change the configuration of your turbulence, so if you take a different realization, you, there you is a large cutter. Okay, but, but so you could, I guess what I'm saying is that, if, right, you could, observationally, you'd probably be justified in going up to, you know. Yeah, maybe 50%. 50 right? It depends on the mass of the core. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> so, um, then uh, it, uh, another, uh, I mean, it's not another, but an interesting uh, instability which, uh, which has been found by uh, Krasnopolsky et al is that it's the so called interchange instability. Um, essentially, it's uh, as you are piling, uh, you are dragging your field in, so you, you pile the magnetic flux in the center of your core, and then at some stage, you have some numerical, either numerical or either physical magnetic diffusion that they should be similar in that case, which will sort of let this, this magnetic flux to be released around. Um, and, and then what happens is that you have this uh, magnetic barrier, okay, because all this flux is just there and matter is continuing, I mean, continue to, to fall. And then you have a sort of Rayleigh Taylor uh, instability because you have a, a top fluid on, on top, sorry, a heavy fluid on top of a light fluid, a magnetic field. Uh, and then you start developing these instabilities that you see here. And uh, so we, we think it's, it's a way to maybe generate turbulence locally around your protostar and maybe it's a sort of setting a minimum level of turbulence that you will have anyway just because uh, you have this instability, okay? So that's, that's another uh, important uh, aspect that we are, uh, uh, that the, the team uh, who are studying this, uh, this phenomena are trying to understand better. Right, so finally, uh, uh, it's not a surprise if I tell you that the IMHD is not ideal. Also, in a sense, uh, when you do turbulence, and when you don't, even when you don't do turbulence, you have numerical diffu diffusion, okay? But when you, do, you have, when you have turbulence, you have even more. Uh, I mean, all this diffusion I was referring to is numerically driven, okay? Uh, so it sort of represents uh, non-ideal IMHD in a sense, but we know that. Well, it's like turbulence. I mean, when you dissipate energy, when you have a turbulence cascade, you, tub you dissipate energy if you have a, a sufficient, um, uh, if, if your range of scale is sufficient. So, um, Alex Azarian would argue it's the same for the magnetic reconnection, okay? Um, but so, anyway, we know that there are uh, many um, non-ideal MHD effects, so to get them right, you have to 
consider networks. It's a bit complicated. I'm not going to describe that yet. Uh, the, it is commonly believed that uh, at densities around, well, depends of your choice of parameters, but between 10 to the 8 and to the 10 typically, um, the non-ideal, say, ambipolar diffusion time uh, will becomes comparable to the freefall time, okay? Which means that when you reach the densities, which are kind of high, then you really have to go beyond non-ideal MHD. So this has been done by a couple of teams, um, and uh, it, it seems that, well, the, the situation, as you will see, is not totally clarified. Um, it, it seems that it, um, uh, ambipolar diffusion by itself uh, is probably not uh, changing the picture drastically, except if you have very, very low ionization, uh, for example. Uh, but for standard parameters, it does not seem to be the case. Um, Omic dissipation is, I mean, lead, lead to a total field, I mean, a very, very severe decoupling between the field and the gas, but at very, very high density, uh, like 10 to the, more than 10 to the 10 typically. So um, the various groups doing as of 3D, 1D, and so on conclude that you should always form a small disk, uh, even if you are aligned and so on. Um, but the, the, the scale of the disk is probably small. How small, uh, it's, uh, it's unclear. Uh, I mean, uh, Bazou and uh, Dab and Bazou find, uh, say, uh, AU, yeah, few AU disks. Machida et al. find more like uh, 10, 20 AU disks. Uh, the situation is a bit confused between Lee et al. did not report the formation of disk in their simulation, but they have a big disk, a big sink particle, so there may be numerical issue, it's still debated. And uh, I think we are reaching a point where the community should sit down and try to do code testing. Uh, so we are looking for a young fellow to take the lead of that and to push uh, <laughs> the older guy to, do, to coordinate and to do the job, okay? So that's where we are at the moment. Right. Um, as I said at the beginning of the, of the talk, uh, uh, we saw many statements in the literature that, well, this is a problem, we should, we should find a way to solve that problem, and so on. I think the aligning case uh, was probably far too extreme. Um, as, as you see, uh, when you have some tilt or some turbulence, you still find a very strong bracking. You still find that the big hydro disk, I would say, do not form. Uh, but you still form something which is not huge, that you could call a disk, and presumably it would be seen uh, as a disk by the observation. Uh, the problem is that I think we don't know. I mean, there is no clear, uh, there is no clear, um, uh, nothing as, at least as clear as for the, uh, say, class two disk, the theoretic disk, where there are many, many, well, not many, but several of them, which are relatively well studied and relatively well understood to some extent. Uh, the difficulty is that when you um, try to observe class zero disks, they are uh, deeply embedded into the envelope, and then there is a confusion between the emission of the envelope and the emission of the disk, and you have to disentangle the two. So some people try to fit, uh, say, power laws, uh, say, okay, my envelope is going to be R minus something, and then you subtract the, um, this emission uh, and what the residual is called a disk. This is, I think, a very uh, unsafe uh, uh, or very challenging business because those cores, particularly when the magnetic field has strange configuration, uh, they are very, very non, uh, I mean, they are complex structures and there is no way you can fit safely the envelope with just a single power law, okay? It turns out that when you try to observe this disk using an interferometer at an early class zero stage, um, you can't, you certainly don't see massive disk like 100 or 200 AU disk. Those guys should be, I think, seen like the noise in the middle of the face, and they are not, as far as I can tell. Uh, and uh, you, you see things that could, well, maybe, well, there is a lobe here, okay? So I let you decide whether you have signals or not here, and the same. 
it's compatible with maybe some emission. There, there is some some emission, okay, but it's probably not resolved at the moment. Okay, and uh, those are simulation, hydro and, and MHD simulation, and for which we have uh, been um, doing some synthetic observation using the ALMA simulator, and, no, sorry, the Plateau de Buren <laughs> simulator. I was a bit uh, in advance. And uh, uh, so that's the signature we should find for a disk uh, produced in a hydro simulation. You see, this is totally uh, rolled out. Okay. Uh, at least for this object, so uh, by the time of this paper, there was five. Now there is a large uh, plateau de Bure survey which is going on. So we have more objects. The trend seems to be the same. Um, and when you do MHD, so you have some flattening, which is not a disk, it's which is a pseudo disk that I did not describe much, uh, which is essentially due to the, the pressure of the field line which compresses matters uh, in the in the towards the equatorial plan uh, but those guys have no cathetic scale there is no uh, there is not a, a physical scale like the centrifugal supported radius so there is a continuity of uh, uh, it's an r minus 2 profile essentially and then you find a signature which are more compatible with the uh, observation so it may be that as I said, there was a problem uh, that was not extremely well identified because of the lack of communication sometimes between observer and theorists. And it may be that magnetic field is actually putting us in a better situation. So it needs to be confirmed. Yeah. So, so have you seen the work by Tobin? And yes. And a lot more shown. He's got now a bigger sample, which was shown in the yes. previous review. So uh, the, the he, he does seem to be finding disks. Do you have any idea of what's going on with, between him and this result? No, the mass, but the mass of Tobin of the Tobin disk is very, very small. It's but like it's only at 0 0.2 solar masses at that point. It's still a pretty decent fraction of the star mass. Well, but here in the sort of simulation, you would have a 0.2 or 0.3 solar mass disk. I mean, the disk as in nature is, is from the top of my memory, 7, 10 to the minus 2 solar mass. So I, I may be wrong, I have to, to see the number. Well, I mean, I think the relevant number is the disk to star mass ratio, that's what he's saying. The disk to star mass ratio that Tobin gets is not tiny. Okay, I, I, I try to, to say, uh, so there is a variety of situation. We can form this definitely if the field is not strong enough, if the field is aligned, if there is turbulence. I'm not saying there are no disks, I'm just saying the hydro, I mean, those guys here uh, would be, I think, too massive and would be seen. I don't think they are. But I think w what we need now is to sit down, observe several theorists, produce a bench of, uh, of situation and try to compare as close as possible. Okay. Um, and, and finally, there is this proposition by Stamatelo et al. That I, I don't, I, that's not the way I see the problem, but I think it's important to have alternative view in mind. Uh, so they propose that the massive disk actually can form, but because they quickly fragment, the chance to see them actually is weak. So the window that, you, uh, that for which you could see them is, is small. And so, uh, well, they try to do their studies and say, well, maybe the chance to find them is so weak that is so low that we can't we can't see them. So, well, okay, I just wanted to leave that uh, for the debate. Uh, so I think I'm trying to rush a bit. Uh, <coughs> So I'm trying now to address a question. Sorry? You, you, you have 10 minutes to get through all of this. Oh, <laughs> good. No, I have 15 minutes, no? OK, 15 minutes to get through all According to my clock. All right, you have 15 minutes to get through all of this. Thanks. Well, it's more than enough. Um, so so I, I try to, um, to discuss the, the problem with the disk. And as someone has already uh, uh, seen there may be a problem with binaries and with the fragmentation. So the hydro disk, so those one, as we uh, saw already, and as many people have been have been done, they, they fragment quickly in a uh, in a few couple of stars. Um, if you have a very very small magnetic field, you see the sort of pattern already being changed, being changed. And if you go to value as low as mu equal 20, which is very nothing, in this simulation at least, you uh, stabilize your disk. So you have a disk because the bracking is small, but it does not fragment. And of course, if you increase the strength 
of the field, this is even worse. Um, so, and this uh, has been also seen in the very large or uh, uh, extensive um, <coughs> set of um, ensemble of simulation done by Machida et al, where they vary the strength of the field and the strength of the rotation axis in the regions which correspond to the observation. So, like mu larger than five and, uh, and the beta smaller than a few percent, you see there is no, uh, no trace of fermentation. Okay, so the first question we may want to ask is why? Um, it turns out that if you look at the stability of a rotating layer, uh, of a magnetized rotating layer that has been done by Linden Bell, uh, if the rotation is uniform, um, well, then I guess you, you can do the analysis because it's, it's an exact solution. So you see, uh, this is a classical, um, uh, uh, can't find the word, uh, dispersion relation for waves in a rotating system plus magnetic field. So you see there is a term here which is essentially magnetic pressure that will add up squalatically to the, to the um, sun speed. And there is a term here, the magnetic tension, that could destabilize the system. It turns out that if you have a strong shear, like what we have typically in Keplerian or pseudo Keplerian disk, um, these terms, so the, the toroidal field is quickly amplified because you twist your system, and therefore these terms become dominant and uh, tends therefore to stabilize the disk. It may also actually produce a sort of uh, um, a s s you make the disk thicker, which tends to also decrease the the density, and we have been actually measuring the growth of the toroidal field in this low magnetized stimulation. So you see the toroidal field growing rapidly and reaching uh, this value for which typically uh, the disk may be uh, stabilized a lot. So I think that's a part of the explanation. Here the, <coughs> the key is really whether IDL MHD is sufficiently good for disk. Uh, I start seriously doubting about that. Uh, so I think the future is typically is now really, and that's there is a PhD student which will defend his PhD soon, who is doing that, uh, which is really trying to go into the non-ideal MHD physics, which is uh, difficult. Um, so uh, people try to take it into account. Um, there is this paper by Duffin and Pudres. Well, they conclude that well there may be a very small fragment here, but I mean, essentially, it was doing uh, amplified diffusions were not maybe not the, the solution. With omic dissipation, machida et al. Uh, so at low magnetization, they get the usual fermentation. At high magnetization, uh, the sort of fermentation, the typical fermentation is totally quenched, and they get some fragments, uh, but at a very, very high density, which corresponds to uh, extremely uh, tight binaries. Uh, so first here there may be issue with the relative transfer, the heating and so on. That's one sort of possible question. And but the other one is when you have such a tiny such a tiny binaries, uh, what do they do? Do they merge? Do they uh, acquire angular momentum and, and become wider binaries? Uh, we don't know. So it's unclear. I think the other uh, to me the most prom promising um, the most promising answer is actually initial conditions. Um, if uh, what's happened is that if you, if um, magnetic field is very good in in in, be, in being amplified when you have a strongly strong shear, okay, when you have a very strong differential rotation. But if there is no such a thing, then the magnetic field does not grow, and therefore if you have initially if you have initial perturbations um, uh, which are present uh, in, in the core, well, they get, uh, they get essentially they fragment individually. You have almost two genes mass in your core. And so uh, the, you, you have this, this fragmentation going on even if the field is, is strong. And even before the, uh, the two sort of binaries uh, become close to each other because they are gravitationally bound, uh, they would have formed, and therefore the magnetic field cannot prevent that. Okay, so to, to me, this is the most uh, promising scenario. Uh, you can call it outside-in fermentation, if you want, versus inside-out fermentation. So the idea is that you form wide binaries, 
which are initially not uh, rotating toward each other, and as they get closer, they have some angular momentum, and then they start orbiting. So th that's my best guess, but this has, uh, as usual, to be confirmed by um, forthcoming studies and observations. Okay. Um, I'm going now for the rest of the talk to uh, shift a bit the mass by well two orders of magnitudes and try to address the question of the uh, of the high mass. Uh, uh, so typically considering 100 solar mass core. So the difference. Uh, I mean, first we may expect difference in the for the initial conditions because initially they have less dense mass. So they, are, they have more dense mass initially. They are denser. Uh, there is probably also more turbulence just because the guys are bigger in size, so they uh, just by say Larsen laws or so, you may expect larger turbulence. We may argue about this initial condition, the detail and so on, uh, we can do that for many years. So I think again uh, we need to do some space parameters and uh, maybe zooming simulation, anything. Um, so various teams uh, try to look at the different effects. Um, so the Mark investigated a lot the effect of the relative feedback um, without magnetic field, I guess. And then uh, we investigate the case of the magnetic field. We saw for Loma's guy that it was very good to actually quench the fragmentation. So the question was, well, can you do that also for high mass stars? The question is uh, a little bit, but not much. Um, so you have three simulations here. Uh, so weak magnetic field, intermediate and strong. So you see you reduce the fragmentation, but you don't quench it. At the end, when you try to quantify it, it's kind of factor two-ish, okay? Uh, part of the answer is because there is a lot of magnetic diffusion, which has been uh, induced by the turbulence and which uh, leads to a leak of uh, magnetic flux, and therefore you create uh, central regions which is much less magnetized. So that's one aspect of the, of the problem, but we know that star formation, uh, that massive stars are, as Mark showed, uh, extremely strongly influenced by their relative uh, feedback due to the accretion luminosity. And so <coughs> we, uh, we uh, tried to, um, to run simulations. Uh, that's the work, that's the PhD of Benoit Commerson. Uh, where uh, the relative feedback was taken into account, so using this gray approximation and uh, diffusion uh, uh, approximation for the uh, relative feed for the relative for the radiation, which is a bit rough, but that's the best uh, we are doing at the moment. Um, and so we ran this full simulation. So the first one is pure, pure uh, spherical. Uh, is purely aerodynamic and spherical initial conditions without any turbulence. The second one uh, has a weak magnetic field, uh, uh, then intermediate and then strong. So what strikes us immediately is that uh, for all the almost idle case, that's an early stage, but you still form value fragment, even so relative transfer is included. Okay. Uh, and, but for when you have a strong magnetic field, it's not the case, okay? And the, this result has been essentially, well, almost, I would say, confirmed. There are differences in the initial conditions, but the conclusion of the two papers is about, are very similar, so we can say to the first order confirmed, so that the, magnetic, the combination of magnetic field and relative, uh, relative feedback seems to be very efficient to quench the fermentation you may have otherwise. And this has been, uh, you can uh, see this more, more clearly if uh, you run a lower resolution lens, then you can, you can go further uh, in the calculation. You see uh, the hydro case, the, so the radiative hydro case fragmenting a lot, forming something like a cluster, and the MHD radiative case not fragmenting at all. So the question is why? Uh, yeah, so it seems that the combination of both uh, magnetic field and radiations is, can possibly quench fragmentation in massive stars. The question is why? So our interpretation is, is the following. Um, this is the temperature as a function of density. Okay, temperature as a function of density. Uh, for the, three, the four simulation I was uh, describing previously, 
So the purely spherical one, the almost hydro one, uh, the intermediate, and strongly magnetized one. So, and this is the uh, barotropic equation of state. So this is isothermal, and then at high density, the gas switch and becomes adiabatic. Um, in, if you are purely uh, hydro, but spherical initial conditions without any turbulence, you see that the temperature increase much, much uh, beyond the barotropic equation of state. So you can see uh, almost one order of magnitude. Okay, and that's because uh, the, in a massive stars, the accretion is extremely strong, and therefore uh, the accretion luminosity is also strong and will hit the gas very efficiently. If you do, you repeat the calculation, but with some turbulence, which then therefore implies automatically some angular momentum, you see the gas being heated, but much less than what you have in the purely uh, spherical case. And our interpretation, which is confirmed when you look at the simulation, is that it's because um, of the angular momentum and turbulence, uh, instead of having just one accretion uh, center, you have not many but several, uh, you have essentially spread the accretion onto a kind of big region, which is sort of rotationally supported. Okay? So instead of concentrating all the accretion and therefore instead of having all the accretion luminosity emanating from a single point, you have now many or several points in the simulations which deliver uh, this uh, relative feedback. And as you know, the uh, accretion luminosity is proportional to the uh, gravitational energy which is released. And therefore, if you have scatter, if you scatter around your uh, accretion, then you decrease the amount of relative feedback. So we, see, we, we, we think this is the difference between these two simulations. Now, when you have a strong B, okay, then you recover more or less uh, the temperature dependence that we have in the purely idle, uh, in the purely spherical case. Okay, it's those quotes are very similar. So what we think is happening is that the magnetic field, because it removes angular momentum, concentrate the accretion onto a single center because it gets rid of the angular momentum. And therefore, uh, it leads to a more, to a higher uh, relative feedback, which uh, uh, is able then to stabilize your core against firm rotation because it's much uh, warmer than uh, in the purely, uh, say, barotropic case. Okay, so we think the difference uh, is due to, to these effects. Okay, and uh, Again, um, some comparison with observation. I'm, I mentioned this paper, there are, there are other. Uh, it seems that at least in, there are some cores, okay, that could be uh, extremely fragmented, like, or oh, kind of, yeah, significantly fragmented, like this one, sorry. Uh, well, yeah, sorry, the observation are there. So like these observations here, in this <laughs> core, you find a couple of fragments. Uh, in this one, there is mainly one, maybe another one, but they are much less fragmented. So. We don't uh, know in great detail what is happening in those observations yet, in particular because we don't have the magnetic intensity, uh, but that's a possible explanation. Uh, further studies have to be, to be done. So I think I'm done and I'm just uh, leaving uh, with these conclusions. Thanks for your attention.